Hi, everyone. Hope you're doing fine. Uh, welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Stockholm Environment Institute's uh, Gridless Initiative. My name is Karina Barquet. I'm a senior researcher at SCI. I'm also team lead for the Water, Coast and Ocean Group and lead for the Gridless Initiative solution hosting the event today. I would like to walk you through today's agenda as well as some instructions. My colleagues will be posting some information in the chat. Please uh, have an eye. And uh, today we will be looking into something promising, something upcoming uh, and yet slightly experimental. We will be exploring whether multi-purpose platforms, also called multi-use platforms, also use multifunctional platforms in the ocean can help us fast track the expansion of renewable energy production. Uh, we will learn about new research on the potential of combining offshore wind and hydrogen power with an expert panel mapping and what should be the next steps. As you might recall, in the recent climate meeting COP28, countries committed to triple renewable energy production by 2030, but this is going to require massive transformations of the energy sector and will be placing huge demands on our ocean. So today we will be discussing a promising solution, or at least a solution hailed as a promising solution, uh, marine platforms, uh, which have the potential for combining offshore wind, offshore wind farms uh, and share the space with, for example, floating solar or wave energy, aquaculture or hydrogen production. Uh, this is explored in a new policy brief authored by my colleagues Guido Massa and Maria Cilia, uh, where they describe the potential for this solution and what's currently holding them back. We also have two special guests today that will provide uh, opinions and some thoughts uh, about this development. Uh, Celine Frank, uh, her policy officer from the EU Commission and DJ Mare, uh, and Manny Meister and Alessandro Tampieri from Orsted. You're welcome to post your questions uh, uh, in the chat. There's a special function. You don't need to wait until the end. Uh, you can just post them throughout and we'll try to pick them up later on. The webinar will be closing down with some final thoughts. Uh, before we move on, I'd like to introduce you very, very shortly to the initiative hosting uh, this work, the Gridless Initiative. Uh, it has been running for four years, and it's essentially looking at the provision of critical services, particularly water, sanitation, and energy, beyond the centralized grid. So we look at different nuances or shades of decentralization with the micro many uh, grids totally decentralized uh, and various functions that not, don't necessarily build on the gridded work. And this is where multifunction platforms come in. Uh, they could be centralized, but they could be also decentralized. And this is part of what Guido and Maria will talk about today. Uh, I could talk about gridless solutions for mm, a long time, but that's not my job today. Instead, I will hand over to my colleague, Maria, to start off today's uh, presentation. Maria, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Karina, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, we will talk today about the marine multifunctional mobile and modular solutions we explore in the Gridless Initiative. Uh, I'm a senior researcher at SEI in the Energy and Industry Transitions team. And what we set out in the beginning of this project to do was to see how the literature uh, defines the solutions and what are the most attractive options we have uh, for the time being and for the future. So starting from the marine world, we have seen different kinds of applications uh, of wind energy, wave energy, even aquaculture at the individual level. So solutions that are independently standing on their own, usually with the use of platforms at sea, they can be mobile, they can be static, but still having, uh, having this independent installation uh, aspect to them. What we try to explore is how, is how multifunctionality comes in, and we have the common concepts of multi-use, uh, which can be about the simultaneous provision and clustering of services, you can use the same structure, uh, you can use the same resource uh, as energy or water or anything else, or you can use the same location, the co-location services. So 
usually the definition of multifunctional is the co-use, the coexistence, or the co-location, uh, either based on economic interaction or spatial proximity or resource, uh, resource allocation. Uh, where the M4s come in is that we try to add concepts that we want to introduce to fully capture the, per the potential of these marine gridless solutions. Uh, and that's uh, two main aspects that we're looking into, and that's mobility and modularity. The mobility can be either continuous, we're talking about uh, power ships or other kinds of uh, vessels that provide services, uh, combining different uses and functions, but it can be also intermittent, the possibility to move some structure from one place to the other. And also modularity, which is the division of a system, sometimes very complex, to individual components, uh, which makes it easier to assemble, disassemble, and also build up or down depending on need. So we looked uh, into solutions that are, as mentioned, marine, multifunctional, mobile, and modular. And all of this together combined, we call them M4s. This is something that will come up as a term throughout this webinar. And uh, it's an introduction of a term that we did at uh, SCI in order to capture this full perspective of uh, multifunctionality at sea. What we do here is zooming in on specific multifunctionality aspects, exploring the correlations between different technologies, and also analyzing what are the common themes that we see in research and development. So what are these themes is that we have very little on all four aspects. If you look at the existing literature and discussions, uh, we don't see the marine multifunctional, mobile and modular being combined that often. Mobility, modularity are the least explored, and we hope through this webinar and the discussions we share today that we get more uh, in this direction. A lot of the studies that we see if you're looking into the research world are theoretical. So we don't really know what is really feasible to combine and at what scale it is feasible to combine it. We see that there are co-benefits and synergies. They make more sense with multifunctionality, but uh, we lack the capturing of the outside non-English speaking world if we just look at the peer reviewed literature. So we started by taking the outlook on what the research on, review, on marine multifunctional modular mod, mobile solutions is about. And we tried to map a little bit what kind of studies we had. We reviewed a lot of, of studies, about 2000, boiled it down to 70 approximately studies that we went really into detail. And here you can see the mapping of how the different technologies and solutions are combined in multi-use platforms. Offshore wind is the most common technology. And the combination with WAVE uh, accounts for almost half of the studies that we looked into. So quite popular solutions there. Aquaculture is sometimes mentioned along multifunctional solutions as an opportunity to expand a little bit beyond the energy world when it comes to co-benefits and synergies. But what we really want to focus on today is actually the combination of wind and hydrogen, which was uh, highlighted in only five of the studies that we reviewed in literature but is very popular in the outside world, let's say, uh, with a lot of developments around the world and a lot of discussion on what the potential with it can be. So we would like to uh, give a perspective on, uh, on this uh, good combination of uh, multi-use in, uh, in C. So my colleague Guido now will talk about uh, our investigation of how offshore wind and hydrogen is combined today and what is the outlook for the future. Thanks a lot. Off to you, Guido. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. I'm Guido, and I was uh, an SEI intern last year. And the brief that we're going to be discussing is the, the result of the work that we were doing while I was there. So as Maria mentioned, uh, following the literature review that they did in the team, we wanted to get a sense of how these projects were doing outside of the academic environment. And so we focus on assessing the current state of commercially focused M4 projects. And to do that, we centered our research around three main questions that uh, you should be seeing on the screen. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to shed light on the outlook of the projects, the barriers that they were facing. Like if there are so many projects planned, why are we seeing, why are we not seeing so many of them in the water? And also we wanted to get an idea of which use combinations were leading the way and see if we could assess them with uh, hard numbers. 
So the way we decided to go about this was to split the work in three stages. The first one was to do a systematic review of online information to identify and to classify existing projects. Then we did a series of uh, semi-structured interviews with stakeholders that were active in the field. And finally, we decided to do a techno-economic analysis on a combination that stood out from the first two stages. And well, spoiler alert, it was uh, offshore wind and hydrogen. So on the first stage, what, what we found was that the most, most of the projects were somehow centered on combining wind energy with something else. And that didn't come as a surprise considering the growth of offshore wind in recent years, and especially here in Europe. Most of the projects were centered around uh, energy production or transport, transmission, and combining wind energy with wave energy, solar energy, and hydrogen production. The combination of wind and hydrogen was by far the most common, uh, as Maria mentioned, with a total of 11 projects out of the 30 that we found. And another combination that stood out and that has been increasingly receiving a lot of attention is that of combining uh, offshore wind with aquaculture, and that can be seaweed aquaculture, mussels, scallop farmings. Uh, we, we're seeing a lot of these projects starting to, to come together. In terms of geographical distribution, though, we found that uh, just as was the case with the academic research, uh, Europe has been leading the way, and 75% of the projects uh, were located in European waters. And a notable exception is China, where we found four projects that were all centered around um, combining wind energy with uh, aquaculture. And uh, overall, we found that uh, all the projects were at an early stage of development, with 28 out of the 30 projects being at a concept phase or doing pilot testing. So we are not really expecting uh, widespread commercial deployment in the short term. Uh, moving on to the stakeholder interviews, we decided to structure them around six main areas. So as a general consideration, we found that combining different energy sources was perceived as the most intuitive and the simplest combination. Whereas combining completely different industries, of course, started to introduce more complexity. And that could be from a technical point of view, logistics, and also in terms of uh, establishing liabilities within users. On the technical side, um, a common theme was that there are no major technological barriers since most of the equipment uh, already exists. But however, some technologies are still considered immature. This is also where the benefits of modularity were mentioned the most, as it was mentioned that building modular units could make uh, construction, transport, and installation easier. And you could also use, for example, smaller maintenance vessels and swap faulty units while the rest are still working. So in the end, you could get savings in operation and maintenance and also um, lower downtimes. Um, here, the need for large-scale demonstrations was uh, mentioned as the most critical factor, as it would create uh, reliable data on how this, uh, the systems will work together, and that could help really bridge the gap between research and uh, commercial deployment. And in terms of strategy, we wanted to see who the most influential players were and who the stakeholders thought, um, or where the stakeholders thought the largest potential was, was lying. So we found that large developers and policymakers were perceived to have the most influence and that the partnerships between technology developers and project developers were the most common, were the most common as the developers are the ones that have the financial and operational capabilities and the OEMs are the ones that are develop, developing these key technologies. And as for the combinations with most potential, again, uh, the combination of different renewables and their integration with hydrogen and the combination of offshore wind and aquaculture were uh, mentioned the most here. We also asked about the main economic advantages and disadvantages. And as we already mentioned, savings in operation and maintenance um, was, uh, was key here and was mentioned a lot. And in the case of uh, hydrogen, uh, it was mentioned that it could either reduce curtailment if you're using it as an alternative source of uh, offtake for your energy, or if you're producing exclusively hydrogen, then you can reduce your, um, your levelized production costs. As for disadvantages, uh, of course, we found that these projects require large uh, investments, so they are not really accessible to anyone who might want to start one. Additionally, uh, the current business cases are fairly uncertain because of the immaturity of the technologies and the supply chains, because on, and also because there's not that much real-world data out there on the cost of operating them. So again, the need for demonstrations was uh, stressed here as well. In terms of policy and regulation, we found that in general, projects are faced with commerce and permitting procedures. And in most regions, also multi-use is not really contemplated and exclusive rights are still kind of the guiding principle. 
So developing regulatory frameworks that enable and incentivize the sharing of ocean space could really help uh, speed things up. And unsurprisingly, the lack of such a regulatory environment was mentioned as one of the main barriers as um, multi-use is uh, it's being applied in really in only a few places from a regulatory standpoint. And uh, well, the immaturity of the technologies, as I mentioned before, and of the supply chains and some markets uh, was mentioned again here. And we are seeing this over different industries. And we even see it uh, a lot in offshore wind now with very strained supply chains that are exerting a lot of pressure in, uh, in many projects. And finally, it was pointed out that the exclusive focus that countries are putting on achieving the lowest price of, of energy means that there is an uneven playing field where newest technologies really can't compete. Then uh, finally, in the last state, stage of our research, which is the, the main um, focus of our brief, we decided to conduct the techno-economic analysis on the production of hydrogen from offshore wind. This is because, as we showed, it was the com most commonly occurring project um, that we found, and it was also cited, cited as a very promising use case during the, during the interviews. <clears throat> so to do that, we decided to evaluate the levelized cost of hydrogen of three different production strategies and compare them. The levelized uh, cost of hydrogen, by the way, is an indica indicator that shows the cost of producing one kilogram of hydrogen when you consider the total investment and operational costs throughout the lifetime of your project. The three strategies that we were comparing, um, they compared onshore and offshore production. And within uh, offshore production, we were comparing centralized and decentralized production. In the onshore production scenario, you see that the electricity from your wind farm is transmitted uh, uh, with an HVDC cable to an onshore electrolyzer, and that's where you produce. Whereas in the offshore centralized scenario, you would transmit the electricity to uh, an offshore platform, and that's where you would have your, your electrolysis plant, and then you would transmit to shore with a dedicated uh, hydrogen pipeline. In the decentralized scenario, however, you would have your electrolysis plant in each of your wind turbine platforms, and then you, your hydrogen would uh, converge in a centralized uh, compression station, and from there you would pipe to, to the shore. What we found was that over the entire range of uh, chosen wind farm sizes, so uh, we, we had uh, capacities from 100 megawatts to 2,000 megawatts, uh, centralized offshore production yielded the lowest uh, LCOH. But after 800 megawatts, the difference uh, started to decrease uh, significantly. One important note here is that the level that we found that the levelized cost of hydrogen was highly dependent on the levelized cost of electricity, which, uh, as you will see in the brief, we took an average for offshore wind in 2022, but that has already risen and it might stay high for some time. So the idea here is more to have a relative comparison within the methods and not an absolute measure, since we are not trying here to predict what the cost of hydrogen is going to be in the future. Uh, we also saw that the benefit of modularity was not really captured by this methodology, as uh, we couldn't really account for the benefits of uh, um, having a modular buildup. So for that, uh, one of our suggestions for future work would be to try to capture that benefit uh, through a different kind of analysis, which could be perhaps an at present value analysis where you would consider cash flows over the lifetime of the project. And for the specific case of hydrogen, we also want to underscore that it's not only important to consider how much will it cost, but how necessary is it going to be in each case. So it's important to consider local realities and local demands. And if, for example, your region calls for more electricity than hydrogen, then that, that might not be the way to go. But however, if you have uh, a lot of heavy industry that you need to decarbonize, then that perhaps makes the case for hydrogen uh, more attractive. And as for the future outlook of M4s, we think that the development of clear frameworks that ensure simple permitting procedures and effectively manage how this space will be shared between different users is going to be critical. And additionally, many of these projects are going to be built on large scales. And as I mentioned, they will need very large investments. So perhaps uh, considering economic incentives um, will be useful to accelerate the development of key technologies and to ensure that they reach uh, higher technology readiness levels. Another recommendation that we can perhaps make is that of including uh, multi-use as part of the non-price criteria when you're ranking offshore wind bids, since we saw that uh, offshore wind is the main driving factor behind this kind of project. And finally, um, we think that local priorities should take center stage when we are evaluating these projects. 
So perhaps it would be useful to use methodologies that not only account for the economic benefits, but also for benefits outside of, of that. So looking at uh, perhaps the impact of job creation or let's say biodiversity preservation. So really looking at uh, the local uh, impacts. So I hope this uh, summarizes uh, the, the results of our work well enough. And you are all welcome, of course, to check out the brief. Thank you so much, Guido and Maria. Uh, this was a great presentation. Of course, I'm biased. Uh, before we move on, I actually have a question. You mentioned that there is a lack of demonstration uh, projects. D do you have an example where multi-use has been implemented? Um, yeah, uh, actually, if we want to look at it from uh, also from a point of view of it having been implemented from um, from an institutional uh, side, you you see it in the there's a very good example in the Netherlands where this was applied in the Borsle wind farm zone, and there they implemented this policy that they call area passports. So they took the space within the wind turbines and they assigned it to different uses and they assigned it to passive fisheries, to renewable energy generation, also for um, R&D activities. Uh, so that was pretty interesting. Of course, there you might run the risk of the government assigning these spaces arbitrarily. So saying, okay, here you're gonna have floating solar, but if you don't need it or if it's not ready yet, then that might cause some, some issues, but uh, it's a pretty interesting case. Thank you, Guido. I think this is a, a good segue into uh, the following points um, in the agenda. I would like to introduce our next speaker. And if I could get a new slide over there. So our next speaker is Celine Frank. Uh, Celine, you're a policy officer of the EU Commission, DJ Mare. And in your job, you follow the topics of offshore energy and policy development around multi-use. And I think you will be talking about what is happening in Europe and the EU when it comes to multi-use, multi-purpose platforms. Uh, the floor is yours. Exactly. Thank you, Karina. And uh, thanks a lot also uh, for the presentation, uh, Guido and, and Maria, and for, for your job. Um, on this, I think it's it's really helpful to have this kind of, of review of what's happening with also a forward looking uh, perspective uh, on what's coming next. Uh, what I can say is that uh, in the past few years, multi-use became really, uh, in our view, essential in the European seas, uh, especially in certain areas that are already very crowded, uh, like areas from the North Sea. Um, also with the Green Deal, and now we have big objectives for offshore renewable energy at sea, um, but we also have big objectives for nature protection, and so this all needs space. Um, and so I, I work in the, um, in the team in DG Mare that deals with the Maritime Spatial Planning Directive. So that's what we do together with member states, is trying to find space for uh, the different activities happening at sea and to really plan it ahead uh, to have this view up to 10 years from now, what's going to happen in the seas and um, what each country is going to do in coordination with the other countries that share this marine space. Uh, so there is a uh, focus on each sea basin uh, in Europe and trying to make all these uh, uses coherent between each other. And uh, so that has been accelerated, this need for multi-use uh, with our increased objective, both at EU and at member state level. Um, so what I can say is that uh, maybe it's something we, we tend to forget, but the biggest multi-use that will happen in, in the seas is uh, nature protection or restoration and uh, offshore renewables, because we have uh, both in the Green Deals these two priorities, and uh, these two will take a lot of space. Uh, Currently, uh, what we observe in terms of multi-use, mostly it's not that. Uh, I would say it's more local projects. Uh, you can think of fisheries and tourism, uh, aquaculture. So you have already many uh, activities that happen together, but most mostly at a local small scale level. Now what we're gonna see, it's really a bigger scale, uh, especially with the different the developments of uh, offshore wind. 
um, uh, wind farms. And uh, yeah, this this will lead to different kind of multi-use, like the, the one you investigated with hydrogen. Uh, so for that, we have indeed a lot of um, research projects ongoing, notably funded with Horizon Europe. Um, and uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, these are not yet, for most of them, uh, really mature and uh, sustainable in the sense that they, they can stay and be profitable for all activities involved, but we're getting closer to there. And we've seen that these projects, uh, yeah, they've been running for some years and then continuing and evolving uh, really towards. So I think we're, we're getting close to that stage where uh, also, for example, aquaculture uh, in offshore wind farm areas is becoming profitable. Uh, it's still, yeah, it's, it's looking at a certain part of the market, not all of it. And, still has um, other issues with competitions and, and things like that, but uh, we see really good prog progress in, in there. Um, I wanted to mention as well the wind package that we published in October last year, uh, which actually has uh, also mentions multi-use and uh, the fact that um, the European Commission is committed to work with member states to include uh, areas specific for multi-use also in the maritime spatial plans that I mentioned before, so which are done at national level. And um, I think Guido mentioned a good example from the Netherlands. Uh, we see that it starts happening also in other countries, in, in Belgium, in, um, in Germany, France. Uh, so yeah. Uh, I think member states understood the value of these multi-use projects. Now we also see that um, in uh, the non-price criteria that are being developed by member states when they do an auction for offshore wind. And most of these uh, auctions now include um, those criteria that can be linked to, as I said, nature protection, but also multi-use or also uh, they need to keep space for combining with other activities, uh, other energy uh, activities. So yeah, it can be wave, can be also solar. Uh, we have good project also with, with solar uh, into offshore wind farm areas that are developing. Um, so all of this together, um, it puts uh, actual uh, uh, the good environments uh, for developing better this sector. And um, yeah, so I can I can still uh, say that the commission is is very supportive on that. Um, we also, on our side, are working on this. Yeah, reviewing a bit what's happening in terms of multi-use, and we have a MSP platform online website uh, where we put all the information um, on on maritime spatial planning, but also uh, there on multi-use projects. And we are now trying to really have this compilation and easy access so anybody can see, OK, what type of multi-use is actually happening um, in, in European seas. So that's yeah something uh, that's coming up in the, in the, in the months to come and, and will be developed uh, uh, in the next years. So thank you. Thank you, Celine. This is super interesting information. I'm I'm taking notes myself here for, for myself. Uh, I have a bunch of questions, but I'm not supposed to ask too many questions, but I think I have uh, a bit of space to ask you just one. Uh, I'm wondering, Giron mentioned that uh, the selection of sites and, and kind of posed a question on, on how this is being done. It's a bit unclear whether it's based on the potential for electricity production or other criteria. In in your opinion, what is informing the selection of multi-use sites in the countries that have uh, made progress? I think uh, so far, yeah, if we look at offshore wind, for example, so far, yeah, it's, it's been led mostly by uh, looking at where, which are the areas with most potential uh, for offshore wind. And then multi-use comes afterwards like is okay. What can we do in these areas that that we plan to to have wind farms? Um, that's been how it how it's been working mostly so far. Uh, but yeah, now there are also talks of okay. Let's look also ahead. Um, 
with the different actors and not only uh, the offshore wind uh, developers, but also let's let's talk ahead in the maritime spatial uh, planning process uh, to include also potential aquaculture farmers and, and see if these sites are actually good for them as well. And uh, yeah, another driver, I think, is the environmental impact assessment that um, all projects have to do. And before that, and that's why maritime spatial planning is also useful, there is a strategic environmental uh, assessment that happens at the le level of the whole plan for each country. So in there, there is also attention given to um, the environment, but also impact on, on local communities and, and things like that. And there is a, a big stakeholder consultation. So I think, mean, yeah, that's an added value to uh, be a, being able to look at the larger scale first and what will happen where uh, in discussion with all the stakeholders involved. Um, for after that, uh, looking more in the details. And in fact, what you see in the maritime spatial plans, they're usually larger areas that the projects uh, themselves, what, where they're gonna be. So member state yeah, plan like big buffer areas uh, for each activities, like looking at yeah, where it would be best located, but then what is developed uh, is again, uh, rediscussed um, and also through the, uh, through the environmental impact assessment, um, then refined. Thank you so much for uh, walking us through those steps. Uh, we will have time for more questions later on. And uh, for you listening, please post your questions in the Q and A. Uh, thank you, Celine. I love your maps, by the way. Uh, I suspect uh, there's some marine spatial planning going on there in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> thank thank you. you so much. Uh, I will now uh, introduce the next uh, two speakers. Uh, joining us from Orsted, we have Mania Meister. Mania, you're a lead business developer innovation. And Alessandro Tampieri, you are also a business developer innovation and project manager at, at Orsted. And uh, I think you guys will describe the current situation, um, probably talk a bit more about what you think and where you think the, inter the industry is heading towards. Uh, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you so much. And I think we might have a slide possibly preparing in the background, but uh, while we get that up and running, um, thank you so much for having us and thank you for the really good introductions to this really interesting subject matter. I think it's, uh, I think as everyone has been saying, it's very timely. It's, it's a good uh, opportunity to discuss this because there are so many different opportunities. So I think we're going to try and Alessandra and I to, to take a step back and um, and really give you that developer perspective of of what does it mean to to take stuff offshore. Um, offshore wind has been mentioned a lot of time as kind of the the cornerstone here. So yeah, bear with us as we probably will repeat some of the things that's already been said. Um, but uh, very happy to be here. So over to Alessandra. Thanks. And uh, nice to meet you all. I think it's a good sign that some things are repeated because it means we are all uh, on the same page. And I just wanted to briefly start from uh, this illustration of an offshore wind farm from the top because it really shows where the opportunity uh, just practically starts from, which is how much space is actually available in between the wind turbines of offshore wind farms. So if we were to uh, fill that space up with um, combining different technologies together, we can really see uh, and get a sense of how the energy production can substantially increase per uh, square kilometers, because you can include uh, an offshore solar system or several wave energy converters, and that would really boost the production of a, a wind farm, while also uh, leveraging on the production complementarity of, for example, uh, wind and solar. And all of this would be done not with a, uh, let's say, one plus one um, infrastructure deployment or O&M uh, regime, uh, but there could be many synergies uh, depending, of course, on the technologies that is uh, uh, developed in, for example, increasing the efficiency of the um, export cable or using crew and vessels um, in synergy for different technologies together. But of course, all of these opportunities come with uh, challenges and um, 
let's say the common denominator between the technologies we've mentioned so far are certainly that they are all very uh, early stage uh, and that they have to be deployed offshore, which is a, a big challenge uh, by itself because it challenges installation, O&M, and also the survivability of the technology itself. Um, so these all uh, substantially increase the costs, um, as also mentioned before, especially from a CAPEX point of view, uh, which then influences the business cases and make it very challenging at times to uh, make projects actually uh, work out. Um, and the immaturity of technologies themselves also create other challenges. First of all, as mentioned before, um, the lack of uh, permitting procedures and regulatory frameworks, which uh, really slow down uh, the deployment of uh, uh, projects because there is no uh, clarity and no guidelines on how to actually approach them. So this will lead to uh, what we believe uh, are some of the things that have to happen. And I will head it back to Mania. Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, from, from now, uh, regulatory um, and permitting has been mentioned a few times. I think we've also all noted that Netherlands is definitely maybe a, a step ahead in, in terms of, of making this uh, a strategic focus. Uh, I think across all of these different uh, opportunities that we see for, for co-use and co-location, uh, that is certainly one. I think it's also important that we take a step back and, and look at these opportunities um, a bit more in isolation. Um, so I've, I've tried here to really group them into whether they are upstream, midstream, or downstream, or biodiversity, which I think in many, in many ways are quite a different play, so to speak. So are we are we adding additional generation resources, you know, such as offshore solar wave energy? Are we adding storage and conversion technologies? Could be batteries, could be any sort of power to X. Or are we adding uh, power demand out there? So are we hooking up to a nearby oil and gas platform? Sorry if our sound is a bit strange. <laughs> um, agriculture is another one where, where we're simply seeing that we're adding the, the power demand behind the meter out on shore, uh, on offshore, sorry. Um, and then of course we have the whole biodiversity agenda, um, which also makes use of the same space, but it's a quite different play. And we're really trying to say, um, fix a challenge that, that the presence of offshore wind might have created to begin with. So I think it's important to say that certainly some of the next steps for all of these are the same. We do need to see more uh, ambitions from, from governments, whether you know local or at country levels. We need to, to see a strategic focus here. But I think as we move closer to maybe the consumption side, we will also have to see um, a willingness to pay and a willingness to innovate from the off takers themselves. So that could be uh, big tech, it could be uh, big industrials in one way or another who, who need to think about uh, the type of footprint they have and what they need. So obviously, as you go offshore, it does call for more uh, automation and remote um, monitoring remote uh, operations. And that's, of course, not something we can do from one day to the other. So so that's where uh, the jobs of Alessandra and myself in, in innovation, that's the type of conversation that we love to have, um, which is basically how do we enable this in the future? So I think that was our very brief five minutes. I'm uh, happy to, to further elaborate. Thank you so much, uh, Alessandra and uh, Vania, Mania, sorry. Uh, that sounds uh, very interesting. And in, indeed, you, you guys are uh, essentially talking along the same terms that the previous speakers are referring to, except from the private sector angle. Uh, I have a question before we get into the Q&A. Uh, operates in different geographies, if I understand correctly. Uh, do you have a market or a location where you feel things are running faster when it comes to multi-use? And why is that? Yeah, I think we could definitely echo that we see more uh, of an interest in, in Europe. And definitely, as mentioned, Netherlands is a good example where things are just a bit more straightforward. Uh, if we were to develop within our own wind farms, there would be a process for which we, we could do it. I would also say Europe 
in a similar vein as to how we got into offshore wind back in the days, we are just more land constraints than, say, the U.S. or, or the Americas in many ways. But we are also starting to see a lot of push um, in the Asia Pacifics, um, maybe more so on, on the, the biodiversity agenda. Um, but generally, of course, we are also seeing land constrained countries with, with a rapid growth of, of power consumption and, and a need for for, for the um, decarbonization as well. So, so I think we, we will see it uh, almost take a similar trajectory as, as offshore wind did uh, a few decades ago. At least that's how it's looking right now. Thank you so much, uh, Alessandra. This was uh, very interesting. I would like to now ask all the previous speakers to please open your cameras. Uh, Uh, Karina, you are muted. Thank you. Now, I don't know how much uh, uh, you heard, but we're going into the Q&A. Um, and before that, I would like to clarify a comment. I believe my colleagues did that already in the chat, but, but still I think it's worth mentioning. Indeed, it's not energy production, it's electricity production. Energy cannot be produced, as, as one of our uh, listeners uh, rightly pointed out. Uh, so there's a question to Orsted here. Would it not help offshore wind power if the official eco-labels, for example, Nordic eco-label, Blue Engel, EU eco-label, etc., demanded that the licenses had to buy green power? Uh, that means power with guarantees of origin from renewable power generation. And I'll ask you to, yeah, feel free to answer, um, but uh, keep in mind the time. Go ahead. Yeah, so if, if I understand the question correctly, um, it's about, um, I guess, pushing demand to to want to be green. And I think we are seeing that to, to a very high extent. I, I will at the same time say that you can off take uh, fully green electricity without being located offshore. I think it's important that we keep in mind why we want to place certain things offshore. Um, so definitely, I think you'll never hear us say that we don't think it's a great idea to, to push for more uh, green electricity demand, but uh, that in itself is usually not enough of a driver to to, to look at co-location and, and co-use of the space. Thank you. I, I'm going to now uh, read two questions, uh, one address for to Celine and the other one to uh, Guido. So Celine, how is the EU Commission working on combining marine spatial planning with the policy and legislation needed to provide the incentives for uh, getting this going? Uh, and I will immediately pose a question to Guido as well. Uh, we don't think for the presentation, you mentioned the need for economic incentives to spur technological development. Do you have a sense of the scale and types of incentives needed here? Um, please, Celine, go ahead. I start. Yeah. Sorry for the light. It suddenly got very sunny here in Brussels. So it's, <laughs> but yeah, you see half of my face. Um, yeah. So I, I only mentioned uh, earlier uh, one policy paper that, um, that deals with uh, multi-use and, and says it's something the commission is going to work out on with member state. But actually, it's been some years that pretty much in every paper related to the Green Deal that touches on, on maritime things or uh, marine space, uh, we've been repeating that, that multi-use is the way to go. Uh, there is uh, places where uh, marine space is already getting scarce, um, obviously for uh, renewable uh, uh, energy, everybody is now looking at sea as the land is very crowded and then we know that there are opportunities there. So yeah, we all, we can already know in advance that uh, some places will get very crowded and, and that multi-use will get very useful uh, if we want to achieve all our objectives. So already in 2020, when we published a uh, communication on the sustainable blue economy, uh, we mentioned the need to push for, for multi-use. And, and I can say also that in terms of uh, research funding for that it, it has only increased in the last uh, in the past years uh, because we see opportunities there we see projects that work uh, they just need the little push more uh, to reach the commercial phase in in, in uh, most uh, places and and yeah there is a cool call also to 
to look a bit more ahead and not just uh, look at the existing wind farm and add things there, but at the design before starting to build them with the help of, uh, as I mentioned, the non-price criteria uh, to make that uh, coordinated approach from the different uh, stakeholders that take part and have the opportunity to, to look at how to better also design these farms. Uh, there are a lot of talks also with the fisheries sector it needs some space in the sea and how we can design those farms to let them pass through because these uh, wind farms are getting bigger and we need also space for, for fisheries to pass through and around. Um, good news is that when they are there, um, after some times, usually we see the fish uh, coming around and some, some reef effects happening in these areas. So sometimes more opportunities as well are created. Uh, that's why I mentioned also the, the importance of the nature protection and um, energy, um, uh, yeah, not production, but <laughs> electricity production at sea, um, then to, to put these things together. Uh, so yeah, I will stop there, thanks. And, yeah, and uh, for the question that uh, Emil posed, um, a sense of the scale of incentives, I would say it's it's pretty hard to to give you a number. But in terms of the types of incentives, I would say any anything uh, resembling uh, grants for research and development uh, is, I think, would be very useful, especially at the stages when uh, when companies are already starting to to do tests offshore, because that that's where I think their costs really start to to skyrocket. So really targeting it to to where they're needed the most, and um, and yeah, targeting them also to to companies where you know this is going to be uh, deployed in uh, in a multi-use context. And if I may add here, when we're talking about these concepts, the part where the multi-use comes in is the, the one that's most vulnerable at the moment, as we all discussed, uh, since offshore wind is driving that transition, you have to maybe target some of the incentives to be on the side of aquaculture or the hydrogen production or anything else that is the combination technology so that there is actual, um, actual interest in new actors coming in to to, to feel the, the security of having this support, essentially, of doing multi-use instead of doing mono-use, um, let's say. Thanks, Maria. I have actually a few questions for you, but before that, I'm going to actually corner Alessandra uh, and uh, Mania. if Because uh, we're talking about incentives. What kind of incentives do you want to have? What kind of incentives do you need to, to be able to think multi instead of single? Um, do you guys have, have thought about it yeah definitely I, I think i think it's a it's a good point of saying it, it has to be quite targeted to what are we trying to achieve so I, I think it's it's worth mentioning as we've said a few times that the lcoe for a lot of these uh say co-generation or or um supportive generation they are just you know we're talking three four five times uh what offshore wind is today so for for things to happen, we need to we don't have to have a perfect business case from day one, but we need to see that this can um, see the cost out that we would need. We also need to de-risk it at some at some level, right? So if we look at wave, if we look at offshore solar, there are still challenges around survivability, and um, we are targeting some of these very tough area so the north sea is is you know uh, notoriously not a friendly place to add anything um so i think it's very important to to basically send the right signals to developers such as ourselves that we understand um that you cannot bear the entire risk here so part of that could be uh, simply um a, a capex infusion in one way or another um to really make sure that that our investment is, is not completely sunk in, in case the worst things should happen or um cost will skyrocket uh, as we're developing thank you and now i'm actually back to you maria um I what did you in, in the literature that you that you conducted? I'm wondering whether you saw any regional differences in the times in the types of M4 projects that that you found, and uh, perhaps whether you can also complement your answer whether you in your interview saw any differences in the types of projects. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, so the the type of renewable energy source that is available uh, defines the projects we saw quite a lot. So in the North Sea region in Europe, for example, it's a lot of wind since the potential is very high. If we go towards the equators, we are discussing in the floating PV panels combined with other kinds of uses. So uh, since energy is driving that part, then I would say it depends a little bit on the potential available, what kind of solutions we see. Another thing that it's interesting is that and I mentioned that earlier, is that we capture a lot of English literature and there is a lot of literature available for the European region since we have uh, very strong R&D projects uh, producing results when we look at literature, as I said, not what's happening uh, when it comes to implementation. But there are indications that there are different ways to approach these projects around the world that we would definitely like to see more of, uh, for example, in Asia, having more um, uh, modular and smaller scale uh, multifunctional platforms that are used to provide uh, services to different to different smaller communities that are under a uh, vulnerable situation when it comes to energy or water provision, for example. We do not have a lot of literature for those cases, unfortunately, only some indications, but it would be another interesting aspect to, to explore. And it might be even worth discussing at the European context and related to resilience and climate adaptation uh, in the future. Thanks, Maria. Uh, Guido, is there anything you would like to add before I move on to my last uh, question to Celine? Not really. Uh, uh, what we found on the when we were looking at uh, commercially focused project projects was uh, along the same lines. So it was mainly driven by what kind of uh, energy source you would have, and and then it it was going from there. Maybe I I address the question slightly different to to Celine why why the focus on large scale projects i think you mentioned as well when you were speaking uh, is there are there any opportunities as maria brings up for smaller scale perhaps even uh, making their deployment faster than larger scale projects um what are the pros and cons and uh, perhaps a second question as well completely different. You mentioned environmental impact assessments and strategic assessments. To what extent are these considering the impacts, the cumulative impacts versus the impacts from single use or single projects, as well as the cumulative impacts at the regional level, not just nationally? So two questions for you. Okay, so I will start with the small versus big question. Um, yeah, indeed, I think the scale uh, has been driven by offshore wind mainly, which it's quite a big scale. Usually, it's yeah we we talk about uh, very big projects, big turbines in the water, uh, much bigger than what we see on land. So that's why these these are uh, by default big projects. But there are other types of multi-use, as I mentioned, that have been existing for actually a lot of. A lot of time. Uh, if if we think about uh, uh, fisheries uh, together with tourism, there's a lot of time that this happens. It's really small scale, usually uh, small projects, but we see that happening a lot in the Mediterranean, for example, with the concept of pesca tourism. Um, so they are really already in the EU example of small scale. Not that much with offshore wind because it's big by default, but yeah, when we, we work with very different scale in there, because for example, aquaculture is a rather small scale sector. Usually that then will take really small parts uh, in the offshore wind area. So yeah, we have to deal with these different scales, different um, uh, capacities, also financial capacity investments. And um, so, but it's possible to combine, combine these different scales together and Yes, maybe we need to also highlight and work more with those small local scale projects as well, um, because they are there and, and they are important. Um, then, yeah, to go back on the environmental question um, and cumulative impact, yeah, it's uh, another word that comes back more and more in the discussions because increasing the number of activities obviously increase the impacts. Um, 
all this uh, falls under the marine uh, strategy framework directive which actually the approach of it is um, reaching good even environmental status for the whole seas and how to do that do that is by putting thresholds and there are different criteria uh, for which we are still developing thresholds some are there already we have done uh, for example on plastic we are there uh, on other uh, if we think about for, for example noise at sea we are still working on it but we have these thresholds that are there they just need to be implemented now and that's the tricky part uh, so these would apply to all sector and that's that's why yeah, we need this coordinated approach and um, for that yeah you mentioned that um, cumulative impacts have to be looked also at the level of sea basin or yeah collaboration between uh, different member states and for that we have systems in place uh, we have regional sea conventions for example in each sea basins that look at these environmental aspects and how to integrate them in, in the different policies at yeah, national and, and eu level so they also advise us um, also for uh, energy production and we have um, um, some transnational or sea basin uh, level uh, organization like the North Sea Energy Corporation, which uh, also looks at maritime spatial planning af aspects, environmental aspects, uh, how to integrate that in um, in the, those div those new developments. So uh, yes, certainly something we're working more and more on with member states, cumulative impact. Uh, something also that we want to integrate in the planning, of course, because yeah, once you know what is coming, you can assess what will be the impacts of all the activities together and see, okay, where it's becoming critical and, and where maybe we need to decrease activity or, um, or see how, where to redirect uh, uh, certain activities. Um, and yeah, I saw something in the chat, like why, um, why considering that we need to go more at sea where, yeah, it's true. It's, it needs to go hand in, hands in hands with what we do on land. Uh, there is a lot to do on land, uh, both in terms of uh, yeah, energy and, and what we can do to save energy, isolate better the houses and, and yeah, put solar panels, all these things have to be done in parallel. Uh, also decreasing the pollutions that come from the land to the sea. So yeah, it, it's all connected, uh, but there are good reasons to go to go to sea to produce energy. Uh, yeah, we know that like in terms of wind, there is much more. So there are, there are really good reasons, uh, economical and uh, rational to, to go at sea while continuing to do all this monitoring because yeah, um, speaking about solar, um, offshore solar, it's really the beginning of it. Uh, it's going to start to expand slowly, but yeah, there have been a, a lot of studies before on, on the impacts and the, the studies are continuing. Netherlands is leading um, and yeah, there is a, a lot of research on that as well that, that is happening before it really expands at a larger scale. Thanks. Thank you so much, Celine. I think uh, this is a, a very good way to wrap up today's seminar as uh, I'm aware there's uh, a lot going on and we expect a lot more knowledge being produced in the coming years as well as hopefully companies making progress and, and, and data being collected to monitor potential impacts, but also the opportunities. Where where are the gains to be made in terms of not just the economy, but also in terms of reducing impacts by increasing the efficiency of what we do in our seas. Uh, you mentioned, Celine, the Maritime Special Platform. Feel free to, to put the, the link in the chat if you want. I, I, found, I found it uh, extremely useful and a good way to synthesize uh, all the projects going on in Europe. I should also say that our research continues. Uh, what we present, my colleagues presented here today is, is really just a, a taste of what's going on. Uh, feel free to reach out to any of us to learn more of what, what, what's happening in terms of multifunctional, uh, the development of multifunctional uh, offshore solutions. I would like to thank our speakers today for making the time to, to, to be with us in this seminar and share your insights. And I would, of course, like to take the, thank the participants for making it. Uh, reach out to us, reach out to the speakers, and uh, yeah, see you at a different point.
Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Right, thank you.